to continue with a theme that I spoke about yesterday for the Gaia House group in, uh, in Devon, only on Zoom, so of course it's not really located in Devon. But uh, yesterday was just fairly short reflection on mudita, which means um, altruistic or sympathetic or rejoicing kind of joy. Um, and I put special emphasis on how to develop some mudita towards ourself and just recognizing like our goodness, the goodness in our heart, the goodness in our life, the blessings of our lives, which we can so easily overlook, especially when there's so much suffering happening and that we hear about happening in the world. So I wanted to go into that again. So for some of you, it might be a little bit of repetition and for others, um, it'll be quite new, but I'll definitely fill it out a bit more. And of course, we'll have some discussion at the end. So in these groups, we usually start with the meditation. So that gives us all the chance to just settle, arrive and rest our mind, first of all. So if you are sitting comfortably, <laughs> then we shall begin. And I'm sure you will be getting increasingly comfortable as you just start to settle into this space and into your body. <clears throat> And getting comfortable doesn't necessarily mean a feeling of ease or comfort. It can also mean getting comfortable with dis-ease or getting comfortable to sit with your tiredness, to sit with your anxiety. I shouldn't use the word your because these are just phenomena that pass through. But whatever it is, the mind can develop an attitude of ease. So just closing your eyes if you're comfortable to do so. And giving yourself time to really arrive into this space, into this virtual meditation hall. And welcome yourself. Know that you're welcome. recognizing all the busyness that you've now left behind. Or perhaps noticing some of the echoes, positive echoes of the day, the sunshine, sky, and now this friendly space shared with our spiritual friends who we may know, we may not know, but we're all connected to the purity of our intention. Connected in our love of the Dhamma, our curiosity, Of devotion to truth, to kindness, to peace.
Just allowing the mind to settle into the body. Soaking it through from head to toe. with awareness and with kindness. Just receiving any sensations that arise. These sensations are also welcome. Just visiting, staying for a while and then passing away. But while they're here, just see if you can meet them with a sense of curiosity, kindness, non-judgment. The way you'd welcome someone into your home. They might be feeling happy, buoyant, or maybe sad or anxious or down. You wouldn't discriminate, you'd just offer them your friendship and your warmth. So in the same way, meeting any sensations that arise, any emotions or thoughts, with kindness, with hospitality. Noticing how that kind awareness relaxes, eases any tension, tightness, maybe even soothes any pain, even slightly. allowing you to arrive a little bit more fully into the present moment. And if you wish, you can stay with this kind awareness, receiving whatever sensations, feelings, emotions that arise. Or you can follow along 
with a little reflection to just bring up a bit of joy and gladness in the mind. Just recognizing our good fortune in having the health to be able to practice meditation. Recognizing that you're free enough, you have enough time to just sit quietly and relax the mind. How wonderful to be free from duties. And to dedicate this time to walking on the path. You're fortunate enough to have a human birth. and to come in contact with the teachings of the Buddha. And also have enough wisdom to intuit that there's something of great value and benefit there. This is certainly a reason to rejoice, something to feel very glad about. No matter what difficulties you've encountered in your life or that you are going through right now, you're still taking steps on the path. making the best use of the human life that you've been offered, that's come to you this time. And just see if you can connect to the goodness of your heart. Perhaps to a particular quality or virtue that you can really appreciate in yourself. Perhaps it hasn't come to fulfillment yet, but you're cultivating this quality. And it's a reason for gladness and joy. Perhaps it's your generosity kindness, courage,
or simply a willingness to be imperfect and make mistakes. This too is something to rejoice about. Something to recognize as a strength. How does it feel when you reflect in this way? When you notice your kindness, your patience, or anything you respect in yourself, how does it feel? Is there some uplift? Some confidence in the heart? Staying connected to any joy, perhaps energy in the mind. You might find the breath arises. Even noticing one breath is a reason to rejoice. This is the meditation recommended by the Buddha. Now you're able to observe just this one breath. You're walking in the Buddha's shoes. Every time you're aware of this simple, humble breath, 
with kindness, non-grasping, friendship and warmth. Allow the breath to be a cause for gladness. A place to rest your mind. And if you find the mind wanders, wonderful. This is a moment of mindfulness and an opportunity to again, gently, warmly welcome the next breath. The Dhamma is always right here.
So we're coming towards the end of this short meditation. I'd like to invite us now to just reflect the few words of Mudita. May I rejoice in this gift that I've offered myself today. The wise intention to practice the path. May I recognize and appreciate the goodness in my heart. Any happiness, peace or joy, however subtle, however humble that may be. May I not be parted from the blessings in my life. And may my joy, my peace, my wisdom increase. And may whatever goodness I develop, whatever blessings, good fortune comes my way. May that be shared with all beings. And with these thoughts, once again, coming back to the body, spreading this kind awareness from top to toe, enjoying any pleasant feelings, any ease, comfort, Maybe a softening in the heart. Today I have the lovely bell, which I'll ring three times. So just listening to the sound of the bell. And on the third ringing, you can gently open your eyes. Staying connected also to your inner world as you do.
<laughs> this bell comes from Burma, actually. It's quite a pretty little thing. It's quite cute because it's the shape of a bell, as though it's not a bell, but it actually is a bell. So it's both a cutout and a real bell in one. <laughs> So, as I mentioned, today's theme is about rejoicing in our inner goodness. I kind of thought perhaps it can be even around celebrating the blessings in our life as well. And um, yeah, this is the Pali word mudita. And the word mudita actually comes from the root modati, which means to rejoice or to celebrate. And uh, in Buddhism, especially in monasteries, we have what's called the Anumodana, um, which we chant before meals to kind of rejoice in the blessings that we've received from others and to share that gratitude and the goodness of those generous deeds with others. So it comes from that root. And it's also related to the word pamoja, this word mo, yeah, mudita, pamoja, anumodana. It's quite a nice word, mo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, pamoja is also, it means joy. And it's one of the um, qualities that arises in the mind when we start to meditate, or as a result, perhaps, of virtue, living a virtuous life and having a little bit of sensory strain, we start to um, enjoy this pamoja which is happiness, but happiness that comes from inside. So in the Buddhist path, it's not only about suffering. We're talking about you know, the cause of suffering, the way out of suffering, but that way out of suffering is actually a path of ever increasing and ever purifying joy. So the joy becomes increasingly refined and peaceful. It has a very different flavor from the pleasure of the senses as such that the Buddha would actually say there were two kinds of happiness. And he said in the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, that's I think Majjhima Nikaya 139, he said there are two kinds of happiness, one which is to be pursued and one which is not to be pursued. One which is to be feared or to be, you know, to have caution around, let's say, and one which is not to be feared, which is actually to be pursued, cultivated and developed completely. And of course, the one to be feared or to have a little bit of caution around is the pleasures of the senses. And as I said yesterday, it's not because um, these pleasures are necessarily bad or wrong or immoral. You know, sometimes we can have pleasures in the world which are perfectly in line with the precepts. You know, for example, enjoying a beautiful day, enjoying the golden daffodils or the different kinds of magnolia trees in the park. And this is the kind of joy that can actually uplift the mind because it's quite restful. And I think nature is very close to, to Dhamma, right? I mean, we can witness a lot of these natural laws in nature. We can see how the blooms kind of come to their fullness and then they start to wither away. They turn brown and then they fall down onto the ground. You know, we can see how it's non-self in the sense that we can't control nature. Nature is something that's happening around us that we're not in charge of, yeah. I remember when I used to go to the Himalayas, uh, I lived in the Himalayas for many years, but, you know, always on these six month visas. So I'd have to like go from India and then to Nepal, but you'd go on to all these different altitudes and see these beautiful rhododendrons and, you know, all the changing nature around you. But then you had these snow capped mountains that seemed to be floating in the sky. And I used to think that is a part of nature that can never be conquered or controlled. You know, it's so out of range of human um, interference. And of course, we can climb these things. But there was one um, mountain in Pokhara, uh, Machu Picchu. It sounds like the place in Peru, uh, the Fishtail Mountain, and it wasn't allowed to be climbed. It was a sacred place that you know you couldn't touch. You couldn't actually think about conquering or climbing to stand on top of. And so nature can be a very uplifting pleasure, but it's still a pleasure of the senses. So although it's more refined, it's not um, self-sustaining in the way that the happiness of the mind is. And the Buddha gave us various ways to develop this inner happiness. 
And that started off with virtue, it started off with sense restraint. And of course, as we practice the path through the gradual training, that becomes more and more refined. And happiness is actually the um, proximate cause for the deep states of samadhi. So anyone that says the practice of meditation is about suffering and gritting your teeth and sitting through pain, yes, to a degree, to the degree that we can do that with a balanced and equanimous mind. But if it's actually generating more suffering and tension, you know, and, and becoming like a battle with the ego involved, then it's actually the wrong path. And the mudita, the practice of mudita is so much softer, it's much more embracing, it's much gentler. Um, and it's really like, it creates a certain buoyancy and lightness in the heart and the mind. So it's usually defined as um, the kind of happiness or the ability to appreciate and rejoice in the happiness of others as though it were our own. And this is very beautiful because often we think that, you know, if we're not happy, that's the end of it, you know, as long as we're not happy that we become the center of our world. But when we look around us, we can also learn to appreciate that there are people who are fortunate, who are going through good times or who are settled in their life. You know, there are people for whom things are going well and uh, who have a lot to be happy and grateful for. So in that sense, when we start to be able to tune into the happiness in the world, it can give us a boost as well. And the mudita has this special characteristic of being an antidote to things like envy and jealousy. So rather than looking at other people's success and thinking, oh, you know, taking it as a reason to kind of get more down on ourselves and to feel more miserable about our life, we can actually use it in a different way to be happy for them. Yeah. And in this way, we're sort of borrowing happiness. It's like we're, we're having a kind of source of free happiness that we can harness um, skillfully, you know, by developing a sense of um, altruism, a sense of altruistic joy that we can then use in our meditation practice. And it's particularly helpful when, um, you know, we're faced with so much difficult news and it can be really helpful to balance karuna, compassion, because it's an aspect of love. Yeah? All these Brahma Viharas are aspects of love. So metta, loving kindness, is like the love for all beings, a sense of general benevolence to all as to oneself. Um, but it doesn't necessarily specify whether people are suffering or whether they're happy. It's just it's going out in a very general way. So it's very expansive and fairly easy to start with. But then with karuna practice, it's almost as though it's the way love responds and the way love feels when it encounters suffering in the world or suffering in ourselves. That metta, that loving kindness seems to take on a different quality that connects more, resonates more with empathy to our own struggle, to our own distress. And of course, to the distress and suffering in the world. But I think that empathy is an inevitable part of compassion and it's an important part of compassion. And the danger there is that when we empathize too much, we can actually start to take on the suffering and almost become quite overwhelmed. And I know for me recently it has, I have been feeling that sometimes when I've been reading a lot of the news around what's happening in Myanmar, because that is my spiritual home. And, you know, I know those people, I know them as a culture, as a group, but I also know individuals there who are right now, you know, in a lot of danger for their life, in a lot of danger and a lot of fear. And um, sometimes when we're faced with this and we're hearing about it so much, you know, it can move into what we call empathetic distress. And the feeling of compassion becomes kind of heavy and weighty and a little bit too much to hold. And at that kind of point, it really slips from compassion into something else. Um, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think the point of the Brahma Viharas is that they're there to balance each other. And the mudita can really help to balance that kind of melancholy of compassion. Because it reminds us that although there's a lot of suffering in the world and we can't deny, we don't want to diminish that, there's also a lot of goodness, you know, in general, human beings try their best. Human beings want to be kind. They want to come from the right place, you know. 
today um, a lady in Oxford, I don't know if she's here this evening, Sarah came to visit me and she's also very closely related to um, the culture and the people of Myanmar because she's been practicing meditation in the lineage of Mahasi Sayadaw for I think 43 years. So I was saying you've probably been practicing longer than I was born, but maybe not. And I was right because I'm 45. <laughs> But since I was two years old, she's been practicing meditation in that lineage. And so we started talking about the situation. And, um, you know, we were both quite impacted by it. But we were saying, you know, I noticed that the quality of our conversation was all around kind of the best way to respond, like what is right intention? You know, what is the right way to proceed? And I was reminded that most of the time, this is what human beings talk about, you know? How do we be good people? How do we do the right thing? You know, I've had this conversation with someone. It didn't go well. How can I heal it? How can I work toward harmony? You know, and then she gave me this very interesting story about something that happened in America when they got on a train many years ago. And there was a man who got on who looked very kind of um, a bit uh, bereft, maybe homeless, a bit lost, possibly drunk. And she said he got onto the, um, what do they call them in New York? Subway, I think. Subway over here is like a sandwich, but anyway, <laughs> the tube in England. They got onto the subway and she said there was this moment that everybody kind of, the energy sort of withdrew and everybody was a little bit um, on edge. But then her husband has the presence of mind to actually lean into the situation. And he noticed this person with a little bit of paper that he was trying to read. And he said to this person, you know, can I help you? Are you lost? And as soon as he did that, the person responded and everyone else in the carriage started to join in and say, oh yeah, we can tell you the direction, we can show you the way. And it just took that one person to kind of break that initial fear for everybody's goodness, for everybody's kind intention to come forth. And I think these kind of things happen all the time and sometimes we don't really notice them. So this quality of mudita, it kind of gives a perspective as well, because as I say, you know, there can be so much difficult news in the world, but it's really one-sided to only look at the suffering. And also, you know, even situations which are incredibly difficult, they do change, you know, fortunes change. We can see now civilizations, right? They reach their peak and then they fall, you know. Um, of course, at the moment, we're all, I am anyway, very impacted. And I'm sure I think we have some Burmese people here today. And it's very distressing, you know, to see a peaceful country and peace-loving people have to go through so much. And yet for, things do change in the long run things really do change and even great catastrophes great tragedies can bring forth the best in people so with mudita we try to look for that positive side which is there you know but without diminishing the negative negative. and one of the um, definitions of a resilient person is actually you know being able to hold both being able to acknowledge recognize that there's suffering and yet also have the skill to tune into the good. And this is so, so important for us, you know, to get a kind of balanced way to move through the world, to get that lightness, to get that um, sense of rejuvenation when things are getting tough. And, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, but if we look for all the good, it's probably not very realistic. Or even if we look for the negative, it's not very realistic. So which one is true? And I think the more that I practice the path, I, I ask less and less what's really true, because I know that what I'm seeing is not the reality. You know, it's always bent and distorted as long as the five hindrances are there, which is, you know, most of the time in our daily life. Even if it's in a very subtle form, we're not really seeing things as they really are. And so part of the path is learning to use the mind, learning to use perceptions in ways that actually, um, cause the wholesome qualities in our hearts, in our minds to arise and then to develop and to multiply. And in this way, we start to overcome the hindrances. We start to be able to enter deeper and deeper states of meditation and actually move closer towards being able to see things as they really are. So it's really important to have this kind of sense of lightness and joy. 
But what I wanted to talk about mostly is how to practice this joy and this um, rejoicing, this gratitude, if you like, towards ourself. Because with most of the Brahma Viharas, we talk about practicing towards ourself and to others. But with the practice of mudita, I think most of us think of it as something that we, you know, we rejoice in others' good fortune. We rejoice in others' success. And that's the way to overcome envy and jealousy. But actually, if you think about it, we can also rejoice in our own um, goodness, in our own uh, blessings, the blessings we have in our life. And that will also help us to overcome jealousy and resentment. Because usually jealousy and resentment actually arises from a sense of lack. You know, we feel that we're not good enough. We feel that we don't have enough. We need to improve ourselves. We need to get more, do better, move faster, <laughs> be further on in the project, you know, whatever it is. And of course, our society around us, especially capitalist societies, it, it's, you know, encouraging that attitude, encouraging the sense of lack so that we'll consume, we'll buy, we'll, you know, continue to um, increase the profits for the rich, <laughs> increase the wealth of the rich, right? So it keeps us in that rat race. And I think it can lead to a great deal of a sense of, you know, lack and um, low self-worth, maybe not really valuing what we have or who we are. And the opposite of that is to rejoice in what we have, to be satisfied to be content with whatever blessings we have in our life. And um, this person who came to visit me today, she also asked, you know, what do I think is going to be the sort of long-term effect of COVID? And, you know, do you think people will remember the lessons they've learned or grow through the situation? And I said, from my perspective, certainly with these groups, I think a lot of people have come to realise the value of the Dhamma and they've come to realise a lot of the blessings of their life. You know, just the fact that we are all safe, we're safe enough, we've got time enough, health enough to be able to come to sessions like these, to be able to devote our time, you know, to self-development, if you like, really non-self-development, but, you know, time for our spiritual path. This is a huge privilege that most people don't have, no matter how pious, no matter how devoted they may be, if you don't have a safe place to be you know, or if you have to flee suddenly because they lock things down in India and, you know, all these workers who are on contracted, they just had to walk thousands of miles to get back to their villages. And, you know, hearing about this and seeing photos on the news just made me feel so grateful for these four walls, you know, so incredibly grateful that I know there's going to be food for me every day. If there's not, I can ask somebody, I can ask a friend or a supporter and just say, you know, put the word out and, and everything works, right? We're living in a functional society, more or less. And then with the situation in Burma, you know, I think it really brings home, to me anyway, that however flawed our own democracy, it is still democracy. It's nothing like military dictatorship where you're being warned that if you go outdoors, you'll be shot in the head. You know, they're actually flashing this up on the news on people's televisions, you know, ordinary people in Myanmar, they're look, putting the news on and being told, if you go out, you'll be shot in the head or the back. Yeah, great. And really, you know, doesn't that bring home a sense of appreciation for what we have? Of course, the negative side of this can be that we then think, oh goodness, it's not fair you know, I don't deserve this. How can I feel happy when other people are suffering so much? You know, we can feel guilty about it. But I think it's important to ask if guilt arises, how is that guilt really serving myself? And how does that guilt serve anyone else? You know, it's only wearing us down. It's a negativity, a defilement of the mind, which basically drains your resources. So we use these perceptions not because they're true so much as because they're helpful. And by resourcing ourselves, by being able to draw on what we have going for us in our life, the blessings of health, of time, of spiritual friendship, you know, the blessings of having come in contact with the Dhamma, the blessings of just being a human being and, you know, having the potential to do so much good. By reflecting in this way, we can, you know, encourage ourselves. We can 
rejuvenate our minds and really incline to the greater good. You know, it's always been the case that encouragement is one of the best ways to um, educate. You know, if you come to a class and there's a teacher who sort of says, oh yeah, you know, that's really good. That question wasn't quite right, but you know, you're doing well. You're, you're definitely learning and, and, you know, I can give you some extra help that's much better than being kind of wrapped on the nopples or told to go to detention because they failed their test. You know, one is going to lead to a sense of despondency and hopelessness and the other is going to make you feel like, yeah, you know, I'm good enough. I'm doing well. I have potential. Yeah. I spoke to my dad yesterday before speaking on this subject and I said, what do you think, you know, about rejoicing in your own goodness? I kind of wondered what he'd say. Because it's such an alien concept, isn't it, to most Westerners? And he said, oh, he thought about it for a bit. And he said, you know, I think you should give yourself a chance. I think we should give ourselves a chance. <laughs> it was so sweet. Oh, yeah, that's a really nice way to put it. He said, yeah, give yourself time to think and reflect about life, you know. Give yourself time to just, just be <laughs> and appreciate, appreciate what you have. And I said, oh, that's interesting. When I, when I first asked you the question, like, what was your initial response? And he said, oh, because it's quite counterintuitive, isn't it, in Western society to, like, bring up your goodness. It's like, is that selfish or is it kind of egocentric? And he said, yeah, my first thought was it's quite selfish. <laughs> but then he quickly changed it around. Yeah, he quickly changed it around. And I think for a lot of us, we can have that blockage in the beginning, right? Oh, it's not really right. But this comes from misunderstanding that we're like rejoicing in ourselves as um, in an egotistical way. But actually what we find when we do this and we bring up, you know, our own virtue, our own kindness, is that we're actually starting to get wise around cause and effect. We're actually starting to notice, okay, how does it feel to be generous? How does it feel? You know, what's the feeling I get before I do a generous act? How does it feel to do that generous act, to give something away or to give somebody something or to say a kind word? How does that feel in my heart when I'm doing it? And also, how does it feel after I do it? Can I notice the karmic, if you like, effect. Mm. And actually the word karma is not really right. Karma is the action, the intention, and the effect is the vipaka. It literally means like the result, the result. So how does it feel when we've been generous, when we've, or when we've avoided saying something mean, right? We've just used that little bit of restraint and we've avoided it. Can we notice that? Can we actually say, yeah, well done there, you know, and feel kind of, uh, encouraged by our own restraint. You know, sometimes we make mistakes, we do stupid things, and then it's easy to beat ourselves up. But what if we could turn that around and say, okay, I made a mistake and, and I'm okay with that. I'm willing to make mistakes. Then it becomes a strength, doesn't it? You know, I'm willing to make mistakes. I'm willing to accept that I can be wrong. And that's a quality that I can cultivate. That's, you know, enabling to, me to develop humility yeah. and to recognize that even when my intention's good, it's inevitable that sometimes we, we cause harm. You know, not to beat ourselves up about that, but just to notice that your intention was good, right? I think somebody said yesterday, oh, one of the obstacles to Medita is that afterwards I, I sort of, you know, I'm more inclined to look at all the little things I've done wrong in the day. And it's so unfair to ourselves, you know, most of the day, <laughs> if you think of mind moments, right, if you imagine there's like, I don't know, 10,000 mind moments in a second, I really have no idea how many there are. And most of those are just kind of quite good, right? You're going through your day and trying not to harm anybody, not to harm anything, thinking, you know, how do I look after the people around me? What can I eat that'll be healthy? Generally good intentions. And then we do one or two things wrong and that's what sticks. And that's really what we call negativity bias. You know, the mind just wants to hone in onto anything that we think is a fault. And um, it's just so unfair. <laughs> to ourselves we would never do that with a friend 
sometimes we might, but you know, it's not very balanced. So, you know, the mudita helps us to start training our mind to notice the good. And because we train it that way, it actually starts noticing more and more good. It's like everything, the mind is conditioned, it's malleable, right? Even the neuroscientists have found out now that the brain is like, there's a plasticity there, it changes depending on how we use our mind. For example, if we develop thoughts of gratitude, and they've actually studied this, and they say if you um, just write down two or, three, two or three things that you're grateful for every day, and maybe like another exercise is you can write one thing for about three minutes, like you just write a little bit more about one thing, and then once a week, you can write maybe a gratitude letter to yourself or to someone else. You don't have to send it. And they've noticed if you do these kind of exercises for one month, it causes profound, lasting changes in the brain. And this is just incredible. It means that you start to pick up more and more things in your daily life to be grateful for. A simile came to my mind actually yesterday that Ajahn Brahm likes to use. It's called watering the flowers and not the weeds. And he says, you know, sometimes we pay so much attention to the weeds, always trying to like uproot them. But actually another way to get a beautiful garden is just not to water them and to water the flowers instead. And at a certain point, those flowers will become so abundant, you know, that and the weeds won't be getting any water. You're just not really, you know, worrying too much about those, that the flowers will take over that garden and you won't have to worry so much about the weeds. And it's in my garden now, I've got some beautiful daffodils. My mum and dad sent me some bulbs. Actually, I'm not really meant to do that, am I? But anyway, I just pushed them in a little bit. I was very careful not to hurt any animals. But yes, one of our rules is we're not supposed to dig the earth. So anyway, I've got these beautiful daffodils and at the same time, there's the, these terrible vines that have got their roots basically under the little bit of soil that there is. There are these Russian vines and they just smother and everything. They grow about a foot a week. I mean, they're just incredibly fast. And what I've noticed is that if I notice the vines, once I start to notice them, I see them everywhere. You know, it's like you tune into what they look like and then suddenly you just see them everywhere. It takes a while to identify but after a while you see them. Whereas if I tune into the beautiful flowers, I hardly even notice the vines. So it's like we can program our mind to pick certain details up, which is very encouraging actually, right? Because it means we can program our mind to just focus on the things which will uplift us, the things which will nourish and, and nurture those beautiful qualities in our so the Buddha said, you know, that reflecting on one's virtue is such an important part of the path. It's not enough just to do good, but we have to also reflect on it afterwards. And he called that chaganusati, the practice of rejoicing in our, it actually means literally in our goodness or in our generosity. And chaga is also um, one of the ways of letting go that the Buddha talks about in the Third Noble Truth. It's one of the types of letting go. It's basically the antidote to suffering yeah, and to craving. So instead of trying to accumulate, we actually start giving things away, giving things up, giving away the negative stuff, but also giving the beautiful things from our heart into our life. And so this Chaganusati is really brilliant because you do the good act, but afterwards, when you sit down to meditate, you bring it up in your mind and you remember, you know, what you've done. And uh, it's, it's like it doubles the effect. It doubles the good karma result, if you like. Because apparently the brain doesn't really recognize the difference between something that you're doing in the present and something that's a memory. So that means if you bring up a memory in the mind to the mind and to the brain, that's the present moment. So you're bringing up the good things and living them again and again. So in, in that sense, you're kind of increasing your store of good karma. And as I say, that will encourage you to do these things again and again. Yeah. So it's like, it's like positive reinforcement. And it also creates more of a feeling of 
warmth and connection it improves our relationships you know if you see somebody who's always grumpy and talking about the suffering in the world after a while it becomes really a drain but if we're kind of more uplifted and happy then we bring that also into our relationships in life and in that way we can encourage others also to kind of connect with that we might even inspire others you know on the path so it's really a service as well to keep our minds buoyant and light. And one of the last things I wanted to talk about, which I didn't mention yesterday, was um, the idea of contemplation of death. And I've spoken about this before, but in the context of mudita, it can be really helpful to just do a meditation when you're feeling really peaceful, really relaxed, and just imagine, you know, that you don't have that long left and that you've got to kind of say goodbye to people in your life and you just do a little review of your life so far and the kind of defining features of your life and it's really amazing sometimes when you do this because it tends to enable you to drop all the little imperfections and get more in touch with the general sort of essence of your life if you like and realize, you know, that no matter what's happened, all the ups and downs, there's been a general sense of doing your best, you know, there's been beautiful people in your life, there've been people that you've loved, there've been people that love you, you know, there's this sense of, yeah, I had my life, I tried to live it the best way I could. And sometimes when we imagine that, and we imagine we don't have that long left, it almost forces us to see those things that we can so easily overlook in our day-to-day -day life. You know? Because generally speaking, our day-to-day -day life is conditioned by a sense of becoming, a sense of craving, you know, always wanting to improve. And in a sense, we never have time to just stop and review how far we already came. You know? I'm sure that most of us here are probably quite happy with the way our life is going. I, I hope we are. You know, when we were younger, we may have never imagined that there'd be teachings on, you know, on the Dhamma that we could have access to. Things, real practical things, yeah, that are of value and benefit in your life. I was speaking about that as well today with um, Sarah, who came to see me, and we were saying, gosh, can you imagine how life would have been without these teachings? For me personally, I just don't know if it would have felt very worth my while, you know. I needed to feel there was a reason for the suffering in life. There was a meaning to being here. And even if, you know, in this life, I don't get enlightened, I really deeply believe that I'm here just to do good, just to be kind, just to kind of try and purify that intention as far as I can. And, you know, and to know I've done my best. Because really, whatever we do is always our best. It's based on the conditions, the opportunities that we have at hand. You know, we do our best in that, within those limitations. So there's a lot more I could say, but I, I said other things yesterday. So hopefully the two talks together will kind of <laughs> cover most of it. And I, I do want to open up some questions because um, the mood to practice is one of the more difficult of the Brahma Viharas and it's as I say slightly counterintuitive because we're so conditioned to feel that you know it's not yet quite good enough so it'd be really nice to hear some input from other people about um, this practice about whether you know you can find things in your life to feel joyful about or you know things in your heart that you can that, that that give you, that you can really respect and appreciate in yourself. And perhaps also some of the obstacles that you encounter towards allowing yourself that joy. Yeah. So that is enough for me. <laughs> and I hope that in there, there was something of benefit. Oh, I have to say one more thing. There were two little things I wanted to say. One was a, a sutta, which I, I didn't get to yesterday or today, but this one's really cool. I say this one, it's not a sutta at all. Does anyone know the cookie monster? I don't even know the cookie monster, but I love this quote. This is so awesome. 
<laughs> so this is cookie monster it's this like big fluffy thing it's like a big massive what do you call those things not a puppet because it's too big what do you call them huge thing fluffy it's got a human being inside it i guess <laughs> it's got a big mouth <laughs> a muppet yeah that's it a muppet it's a big muppet <laughs> so cookie monster says me no cry because cookie is finished me smile because cookie happened. <laughs> and that's so nice. Because <laughs> that's also an obstacle to joy, isn't it? We're like, oh, I was happy before, but now I've lost it. And it's like, ah, oh, no, could just smile also for the beautiful things that we had in our lives. <laughs> yeah, I liked that one. Tickled me. All right. Over to you. And uh, I think Leonie is going to uh, host the Q&A session this time. <laughs> if you could say the name of who you're unmuting, that'd be great. Yeah, um, Yvonne would like to speak. Hi. Thank you, dear Venerable, uh, dear friends. Uh, I was so happy to join uh, this Dharma talk today because in my own life I have really, really, really had to find this practice mm. because my husband is dying very slowly and very painfully and uh, I'm really rejoicing today because I went to book him some of his favourite food because he finds it very difficult to swallow. Yeah. And as I was leaving, because he has to be in a special house, he just kissed me, said, that was so wonderful. Oh. And, that, and I'm, I'm from the north of England. I think we do a lot of self-deprecation in the north. <laughs> a little, little bit. But actually, I, I, I really felt it. Mm. And I thought, I absolutely did my best. Beautiful. Every time, every time, any, every tiny little thing. And he has motor neuron disease, so it's a very catastrophic disease. Mm. But um, I, I made many notes because I, this is a practice I need to really work with. Mm. Mm. Days. But I, I thank you so much, uh, dear Venerable. It, it was a complete blessing for me tonight. Oh, that's wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing, because I think what you're touching on there, too, is just the poignancy of such seemingly small things and how they don't have to be obviously big things. It's the quality of intention. and It's just the maybe the timeliness and the, the love that's imbued in in those things. And um, yeah, it, it's lovely because it's important to realize we can be contented with little things. And if we are able to be contented with little things, then our life is going to be filled with happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. Thank you. Um, Vivienne would like to speak. Hi, Vivienne. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say hello to Yvonne and much love to you and John. Um, I'd just like to reflect that um, these teachings have come just at the right moment for me because um, I'm I'm not that well, and I, I I can't get out of the house now. And I um, usually in the spring, I love going to Kew Gardens and Richmond Park. Mm. And every time I see a a bud, it fills me with immense joy. Oh, <laughs> I I can go to Kew Gardens and smile from the second I get in to about an hour after I leave, and I can't stop smiling. <laughs> And this two months of spring fills me with enough joy to last me the whole year. Oh. <laughs> and unfortunately, two weeks ago, at the start of spring, um, I got a bad foot. I can't go out of the house. Oh. And I was thinking, 
how am I going to give myself this, this joy? How is it going to come? And, I, and so listening to you over the last three days has given me confidence mm -hmm. and, and a path so that I can generate the joy. Oh, that's so wonderful. So I thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your wisdom in, in finding that path. And, you know, again, looking for that beauty in whatever you can find around you. Yeah, because sometimes it does have to just really simplify right down. And like you say, just a single bob. You know? um, and also just to remind again of um, that finding that I read about that reflecting on things, imagining that you're seeing those beautiful flowers, imagining yourself at Kew Gardens, the brain doesn't really recognize the difference. No. So we can actually do that. We can create our own beautiful spaces in our heart yeah. by the power of that recollection. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's really funny because you notice my background mm -hmm. and I do, it makes me feel I'm there. Even I, I look at it. <laughs> it doesn't no, look like you're there. there again you know it's like <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> oh, thank you Vivian for sharing I'm very glad that you are coming to our talks very happy <laughs> um Nikki um would like to speak hiya can you hear me Perfectly. Oh, lovely. Oh, thank you so much, Venkanda. Thank you. I just wanted to sort of ask you something about this. So what I, and it's not an unfamiliar practice at all, you know, with the 12-step programs, they talk about this quite a lot in that. Mm -hmm. But I also get, and I don't know where it's come from, there's this sense, this thing of like, you know, the law of attraction thing that's around at the moment. I get a little bit confused with that. I get, is that because in one, I've got a particular situation going on where I can't change it, it's with another family member. So I am trying to see the good, but the fear drives that, I just go boom, like that, I can't, it sort of comes up. And then it just changes that physiologically everything about me and I can't see, it's like I've put on a pair of glasses that I can't see beyond something bad happening. So mm. are you talking about training, is that like the neural pathways? Am I really, is that what I'm trying to do by seeing the good in a situation where I can't see any good in it at all? I don't know what to right. do. Yeah, maybe not necessarily trying to see the good in a situation where that's not coming easily for you. It doesn't have to be that situation because it's not about changing a certain situation. It's not so much about the outcome with that person necessarily. It's more about your own mind. So I would say develop joy where it's natural and spontaneous, where you can get a kind of window in to start the practice. It doesn't matter what object you use. So don't go for the most difficult straight away. It's like with the meta practice, we don't start with a difficult person. So in yeah. the same way with the mudita, start somewhere easy. Start within yourself, for example. That's what we've been talking about today. You know, rather than sort of trying to look for things outside, trying to just, yeah, notice, oh, I have a good intention, you know? And even if you don't feel joy, just notice it because it's not even around whether or not you're gonna start feeling joy, it's just training the mind to at least recognize these things. And over time, you'll just start to see it more and more clearly. You'll be like, oh, I just, um, I just chose to make myself a meal that was more nutritious than I'd bothered to do before. That's kindness, that's kindness. I'm, I'm really grateful that I've got that kindness to myself. And just starting to notice these things and that will give you a bit of uplift in your mind and then you'll find your perception of other people and other situations also start to shift but you're not doing it to shift those other situations yeah. what would you do then if they so if you're just if it just like almost takes hostage your brain hostage sort of appears mm. out of nowhere because of the particular mm. and then i don't mm. know what to do with it then i try mm. 
do I just notice it that that's happened? Yeah, we... I think sometimes we try too quickly to shift things rather than just noticing our response. So I would say because you're having a kind of almost automatic response, mm. it would be nice to get a bit of space between you and that response by just stopping. Oh, I had that automatic response. You can even say that to yourself. Oh, mm. I just froze. And the minute you say, oh, I just froze, you're a little bit, you've stepped a little bit out of the freezing. There's the, there's the part of the mind that knows that you just froze. So you're getting a little bit of navigational space there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So just notice that. And then if you wish, you could even put your hand on your heart. Mm. Oh, that, that's tough. Or, oh, that was hard. And, and that's a sense of self-compassion. So meeting that suffering, because again, you know, this sense of loving kindness has to be appropriate to what's arising. Mm. And if it's suffering that's arising, the appropriate response is compassion, not joy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, 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 thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Mm. Anything else? Anything people are working with or finding difficult or anything that you don't agree with in the talk? Anything. You are welcome. I'll take the chance to read you a little quote because I said this yesterday at the Gaia House group. And I just think it's really nice, light. It was put in a little video that somebody made for Ajahn Brahm on one of his birthdays. And they called it Ajahn Brahm's philosophy of life. <laughs> He's probably got a lot of philosophies of life, but I like this. People might think it's really cryptic, but it's so simple. Have fun with what you're doing. Put joy into your life that gives you energy. And then don't ask for much in life. So whatever you get is a bonus. <laughs> so, so simple, right? Put joy into your life that gives you energy. Because mm. joy does bring energy. And that's another of the beautiful um, outcomes of developing a bit of joy. It energizes the mind and an energized mind is much more awake and aware. So joy, energy and mindfulness, they're like this lovely cycle that feed into each other. The more joy, the more energy, the more energy, the more mindfulness, the more mindful you are, the more joyful you are, right? The mind is like waking up. So put joy into the things you do. Do them with a smile. And then don't ask for much in life. So whatever you get is a bonus. It's pretty cool. Contented and easily satisfied. That's from the Metta Sutta. Not proud and demanding in nature. <laughs> oh, another raised hand. So we'll take one more. Yes, um, Manori. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much, Virabha I haven't listened much about Mudita in Dhamma talks, and it was very, um, very inspiring. And it's a lot of new things to think about. And sometimes you think that it is, oh, it's such a small thing, but, um, but there's so much of deep meaning into this. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And I, um, I was listening to the other people telling about their experience and, uh, uh, and it was very heartwarming as well. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm glad that that came through because sometimes it can seem almost frivolous, you know, to talk about things like joy and lightness. But it's actually such an important part of the path that really feeds into to the whole movement of the path, in a sense, right? The path out of suffering, after all. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in overcoming much, those hindrances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so much of 
bad things happening and you kind of feel depressed and depressed and this is a very good way of balancing isn't it exactly exactly yeah yeah and at the same time you know I, I guess it's important to talk about because I think most people tend to have more compassion probably and tune up to the suffering and most of the time that's what comes to our mind maybe because of that tendency of the human mind to go you know to have that negativity bias so I think but at the same time compassion can balance mudita as well you know so that it doesn't become complacent or or kind of naive so yeah it, it's really great when you see the ingenuity of these four Brahma Viharas and how they all have a very special complementary kind of role. Yeah, yeah. But definitely I think joy can be developed a lot more <laughs> in most people's life. Mm. Did I read that more people have their hand up now? We're coming to the end, but if we can, if there are more people that would like to ask something fairly brief, or am I mistaken there? Yes, um, Mel. Thanks, Leone. Um, mine was more of um, a comment, really, um, because I'm working quite a lot with um, nourishing happiness and focusing on the good. And I heard the other day that um, it only takes three seconds to focus on to um, focus on on something beneficial, good, helpful. Um, for the neural pathway to start to change and that's not oh, so long that's okay really, and uh, because too much longer we we have we maybe go towards grasping don't we so it's that reflection but yeah apparently it's three good seconds and that starts to cement the joyous thing so I just wanted to share that wow that's really fast that's really fast yeah yeah interesting I also heard I mean this I don't think this contradicts it, but this is an important one in case you want to help someone else feel uplifted. I heard another uh, statistic that it takes about two seconds for criticism to register. Say someone criticizes you. It's like <laughs> immediately registers. But it takes about 20 seconds for somebody's praise and, and um, encouragement to sink in because sometimes we resist it. So that's also something to bear in mind. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I think it's wonderful to know that we can already start to change our mind within that three seconds. And especially perhaps if we're bringing up joy in our own heart, but also when we speak to others, we can, we can do a little bit more, you know, and, and just almost exaggerate what we want to say. <laughs> I've noticed you have to do that sometimes. I was trying to tell one non on my veins retreat. Actually, this nun's going to join. She's um, she's uh, in California. Anyway, she's a very sweet nun, and she's going to join us for the Sutta class in a couple of weeks. I think next week she's coming, but the week after, I've asked her to co-lead it with me. I said she could lead it, but she said, let's do it together. So anyway, she's very sweet. And uh, one time I was trying to tell her, yeah, I see, you know, this and this quality. No, 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 no. She kept saying, no, no. And it was like a fight. I was like, no, no, can you just hear me and just like say thank you? Like, <laughs> and after a while, she actually said, okay, I accept that. Thank you. And it was like my whole body was like relieved. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, we have this real resistance to, uh, yeah, to receiving someone else's encouragement and praise. It's probably much easier if we start reflecting on our own goodness. When you say, yeah, thanks. When you say to Roger Barry, he says, yeah, thanks. I, uh, I deserve that. <laughs> People say that's egotistical, but it's actually the opposite. He, he's also playing because he's trying to show us that we too deserve, you know, everything that comes our way. All the good stuff. <laughs> good. All right. Well, I think uh, it's time for me. Oh, yes. I have to ask Leone today. Leone's offered to do the little um, Dana talk. So please do stick around for her out of encouragement. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable. 
Um, yes, I would just like to say um, a few words about dana, the practice of generosity, um, which refers both to the act of giving, but um, also to the donation itself. It's a Pali term. Um, and it's quite an important aspect of the, the practice because it allows us to cultivate compassion and um, joy and loving kindness. Um, and there's this, this mutual support of Buddhist monastics and the lay community where um, the monastics like Venerable Chanda, they practice generosity through sharing the Dharma and then that allows us to, um, to practice generosity by providing material support. Um, so if you are able to give a donation and contribute something, then that would be very much appreciated. Um, and you can find more details about how to do that in the chat box and on the um, website. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Leonie. And yeah, thank you to everyone here. And you know, for me, your presence is already a blessing and a gift. It truly is. You know, it, it's just become more and more obvious throughout this corona pandemic, because I'm here alone, that you are actually my spiritual friends. And I think without the opportunity to give, my life would feel quite drained, quite, quite sort of pale and anemic at the moment, but it really gives it a lot of meaning and a lot of richness and it's just wonderful to share. And thank you for being so receptive. Because sometimes I turn up like today, feeling really quite tired and not really feeling very clear about what I'm wanting to say. And yet you're all just absorb whatever you can get from it. And it, it feels so generous to me, it really does. I mean, I know by now I'm kind of like in the role, but my goodness, in the past, I was actually quite sad thinking I'll never be able to share the Dhamma because I simply can't say a word in public, you know, I just can't. So thanks to the kindness of this community. Um, it's us who are giving the talk, actually. It's, it's a reciprocal thing. So thanks for sharing your energy too. And uh, yeah, and what's the next things on our programme? I think uh Wednesday chanting and then next week is quite exciting because we've got the Sutta class on Friday the Metta meditation on Saturday and, and then also a Q&A with Ajahn Brahm on Saturday and we haven't made it a registration one because when we do that we always get a drop out and then we have empty spaces we've made it uh just turn up and if you're lucky you get in so yeah the link is on the events page it takes you to the old newsletter and then in the newsletter you'll find the link please don't share it on social media because we don't want to get zoom bombed <laughs> but please come along and uh, yeah you'll be we will be asking for questions on the day not before the day so yeah and then also i have a day retreat on the 17th of april called patience and forgiveness that's brighton bodhi tree that's also on our events page and there's masses of places on that so i reckon people are like feeling more to go out and you know than to come to retreats but if you want to learn more about patience and forgiveness and give yourself the chance be patient in developing patience and forgive yourself for not being forgiving then you can come to that okay so let's unmute you and <laughs> sounds really controlling now we're unmuting you if you wish you can unmute yourself and wave goodbye <laughs> thank you venerable thanks everybody bye bye, bye. 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 thank you everyone.